Sunday we had this past Sunday, amen. How many people were here? God just moved mightily. Dr. Craig did a fine job. The Lord moved over the house. And uh, I really want to help everyone who came, or thank everyone who helped with the baptism. Uh, we had a great time in the presence of the Lord. And we're now looking forward to the church picnic here on the campus. And so please be praying for great weather and invite a friend. There will be games, food, fun, and fellowship and frolicking. I had to throw the extra F in. You have to have fours. Okay, we're under discussing the character bents that many suffer with in their origin going back several thousands of years on how to break free from what's trying to break us from the destiny, and so I want to pray and ask God to move in this place. Lord God in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to these fine folks. Forgive our sins fellowship with us as we look to your word in Jesus' name. I was in prayer the other day, and as I was working on this message, um, and uh, can we close those doors? We're either either freezing or cold. I don't know. We're trying to get everybody hypothermia or heat stroke. Need something to pray over to heal, so we start off small. Next week, the bubonic plague. We're going all the way. Um, And we talked about the origins of our character bents that many people suffer with. And so as I was praying and as I was seeking God, God asked me a question. He said, ask the people, do you want to break or do you want to break through? You know, now I want you to think about that. Do you want to break or do you want to break through? You know, now this is something that you have to be very careful when you answer because God hears you. Um, contrary to popular belief. So I want you to stop and think about this because a breakthrough releases the person from what is breaking them or a break just gives you a high hiatus from the process towards holiness. And I think that's important that you understand that there is a process going on and we're going to get more into that this Sunday. But I want you to turn with me to Jude 1.14. For those of you who are not sure what that is, That's just before Revelation, which is the end of the book. A little bitty book that you can't exclude. It's Jude. Revelation, and then just make a hard left. I will be going on a bear hunt coming up, so I'm praying that you all will pray for me, that I, of course, will get a big one. There we go. Yes, Tom, you... Do you want to pray for me and the bear or no? Yeah, but you ever look at the size of that actor and look at me? It's a difference. Yeah. He's from California. They don't kill much. They eat vegetables. They stab corn. It's just it's totally different than what I do. So God bless them. Jude 1.14, Enoch, it says, the seventh from Adam also prophesied about them. And the them are who we are going to be talking about. It is the Nephilim. Okay? Now, if you're new here today, you've picked a great day to thrust yourself into one of the deepest studies within Christianity. So if you were looking for an easy day, it's not going to be your day. Uh, But you will find things interesting, I promise you, and I try to do everything I can not to be boring. Uh, It says, Enoch the seventh from Adam also prophesied about them. Behold, the Lord is coming with a myriad of his holy ones, that's a lot, to execute judgment on everyone, yea, and to convict all the ungodly of every ungodly act of wickedness and every harsh word spoken against him by ungodly sinners. Woo! Okay, no one's excited. You won't be here, hopefully. You guys are scaring me. Safe people don't have to be involved in this. Everyone else is like, oh, we're going to go down. Just fake it and smile. I won't be here. 
Now, again, we said the book of Enoch is not a canonical, uh, a canon of scripture, but we, we do believe that, he, that there is much within its prophecy of the coming of Christ, that there is value to this book, and that it gives credibility to what we're studying in the area of character bets. So, to get everybody up to speed, we said last week that the guardian angels that everyone has, everyone know you have a guardian angel? How many of you want to see their guardian angel? How many of you want to apologize to the guardian angel when you get up to heaven? Sorry about that whole motorbike time period in my life. You know, it's motocross as a kid, and chewing on glass and other things we do. Anyways, um, and these guardian angels interbred with human beings. The scripture says in Genesis 6. So if you're questioning me on this, that you've never heard it before, read Genesis 6. Um, and it creates a mutant race of people. And they're referred to in Genesis 3.15, if you want to turn with me there. Never go to a church where they don't back it up with scripture. Genesis 3.15, this diet is great, but not good for my ensemble. I will look to keep my pants on here. Genesis 3.15, where God tells Satan, I will put enmity or cause a war between you and the woman. And all the women said, Yeah. Some of the women are not so sure. "Mm -mm -mm." And between your offspring, he's referring to Satan, so satanic offspring, the Nephilim, and hers. Now, for those of you who aren't hip to how babies come from, women don't have seed. I don't know if that's a surprise. Even if they want to identify as seed-bearing people, you you still won't, whatever. Um, And so he's saying that Mary's seed, which of course will be Jesus, thousands of years later, and those who follow Christ, will, of course, be at war with Satan's offspring. Now, nowhere in Scripture does it say that Satan had a wife, although some of you women believe you were married to him at one time, and, um, but hopefully you didn't interbreed. Now, <laughs> some demon seed, you're going to the children's program, you're like, oh, deliverance time. Damien, good to see you. <laughs> I see your mother put the makeup over the 666 on the forehead today. That's lovely. Lynn. Hop them up with some more sugar. Anyways, he says that he will crush your head, but you will strike his heel. And we had said that Satan will look to, of course, yeah, thank you. He will look to, of course, hinder your Christian walk. Has anyone here ever found that Satan can be challenging to your Christian walk? Other people get along with him here. This is making me nervous. I don't know. Some people are not sure how to answer. Okay. Anyways, these angels not only interbred with man, but taught men evil and occult practices, along with forging weapons of war. Now, the reason for this is when Satan saw that there would be a man, a Messiah, that would crush his head or take dominion over him, which Christ did on the cross, taking the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and his kingdom, so his guardian angels now turned demons, interbred with man to pollute the human bloodline so the Messiah couldn't come forth because only the purity of God could ever crush Satan. If you're a half-breed, you're kind of half in there, half out there, a little evil, not so evil, 70, 80% a good, 20% evil will not kill Satan. It takes 100% God to dominate Satan. You understand that? So in order to hinder this, he had to interbreed with human beings, because a human being, it says, her seed, and he knew it wasn't going to be a male, so who's the first person he attacks? Of course, he attacks Eve, her seed, because this was giving her another opportunity after she fell to again be put back into God's plan. See, once women ate the apple, if you will, um, they fell out of God's plan, and it brought a lot of curses on you, and then, you know, your periods, and the babies, and all of that, and your, and all that, and, um, so what he did was he said to Eve, not only am I going to give you this, you're going to be, have to be submissive to your husband. Notice I didn't say men. Um, but you also will have another opportunity at redeeming yourself because of your sin. Because God is a redemptive God. He's always giving us another opportunity. How many people know, thank God for second chances? Okay, the rest of you spiritual people, you can just... So what he did was he said, all right, since you're, you have failed here um, by listening to a snake. How many women here have ever talked to a snake? <laughs> Leave it alone. 
Uh, anyways, and so in so doing, he says, I'm going to give you another shot, one opportunity. This was the first Eminem rap. And so he says, what we're going to do is we're going to allow the actual savior of mankind to come from you who failed mankind. Do you understand this? Are you, are you staying with this? He said, since you decided to get, you know, the one time a woman in her life knew what she wanted for dinner, look what it got us, okay? You know what I'm saying? It's just, I don't know. <clears throat> Anyways, wow, that was a rough one, wasn't it? I, people get so edgy nowadays. If you're used to political correctness and being in church, you're in the wrong place today, ladies and gentlemen. Just going to be honest with you. If you're easily offended, you might want to leave or go buy yourself some steel-toed boots. Um, so here's what happens. So he, he says, you know, since you screwed up, I'm going to give you a chance to redeem yourself. And so people read certain parts of the scriptures, and of course they get a little sexist, and they, they don't get what he's saying. He's giving them an opportunity at a second chance. He said, your seed is going to bring the Messiah that is going to actually heal what you jacked up, which is a biblical principle. How many people know that just because you apologize for sin does not mean you're forgiven of sin? Repentance means you turn away from it. You do something to restore it. The Bible says if you steal, you're supposed to pay it back sevenfold. So what he said to Mary was, since you decided to get snacky, I'm going to give you a shot at actually redeeming the world, being a part of that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Any Catholics here? The Catholics, praise the Lord. All right, our Catholics are with us. Okay, they, they get it. The rest of the Protestant, they're just oblivious to the whole thing. Right? We'll stay right here. Now, so here's the reason for all this. When he saw this was going to happen, and the guardian angels then, he said to his, to his fellow demons, I want you to interbreed with these chicks so that we can destroy the opportunity for a Messiah to come forth from human beings. We're going to jack up God's plan. Satan is always trying to jack up God's plan. God's always like five steps ahead of him. Okay? So... He said, let's jack up the purity of the bloodline. Now, we're referring to, and please understand, the spirit world. Don't get it twisted. First of all, in the spirit world, there isn't a female in this room. Not because of how you identify either. You are all sons of God. There are no daughters of God. Look in scripture. And the reason for that has nothing to do with your genitalia. It has to do with your bloodline and Mary's seed. Remember, Mary had seed. Women can't have seed. This is male. And as I said last time, females don't have a last name. They have their husband's last name or their father's last name. Because that's legally how it goes through a patriarchal position. Okay? That is not because God is sexist or anything like that. It's because of seed. It has to do with birth. Because... Eventually, that birth through Messiah leads us to being born again. Okay? Now, for those of you who are hung up on the whole female thing and think that's sexist, remember the church, which Jesus is coming back for, he is the groom, and we are the bride. So, all of us men are technically brides. There you are. That'll really mess some people up in here. We've got people who are like, this church is gender confused. I thought he said he wasn't gonna he was gonna be politically incorrect, and he's just so right there. He's like from San Francisco. Uh, no, we're, we're talking about spiritual issues. Okay, so please, I say that tongue in cheek, but I want you to understand what we're talking about here. If you have gender hangups, this is not what we're referring to. We're referring to spiritual principles. We're talking about the fourth dimension. Does everyone understand that? Just nod. Okay, good. Now, so here's what happens. He pollutes man and he creates the Nephilim. This is why there were people in Canaan like Og of Bashan, a giant king. So these mutants were actually very strong and very large. They birthed freaks. Okay, the first carnivals actually were started. No, I'm just threw that out there. Just thought I'd see if anyone was paying attention. Have you all had a bad day? You all look, what's wrong with you people? We win in the end. It's all good. It's sunny outside. You don't live in Afghanistan. Okay? Cheer up. Tickle somebody. Or, no, don't do that. That's, 
So here's what happens. They create this, this guy called Og of Bashan, a giant. And that's what Bashan means, a place of giants. There in Deuteronomy 9.2. Write it down if you, for those of you who are cynical. We read of the Anak, which also is talked about in the Bible. People great and tall. So before the flood, they were gigantic Nephilim. Huge people, right? Are you with me? So let's go on. So if God destroyed the Nephilim, though, in Noah's flood, which we said he did then how can they still exist today if they were destroyed? Well, remember, what was destroyed? They were half man, half spiritual. So their spirits became disembodied ghosts. I'll use that word. Although, as someone who does exorcisms, that kind of is not true. But the point is, disembodied spirits. Are you with me? Are you following me so far? 2 Peter 2 says, God cast them down to hell in chains. For we read that Peter is referring to these demons since he then goes on to talk of Noah and how God cast them to Tartus, the only place that hell is mentioned as Tartus in Scripture. Usually it is Gehenna, Hades, or Shechol. Here he refers to Tartus. Now watch this. It's referred to as a dark place of woe in Greek mythology. Tardis is a place that was far below, farther below than Hades itself, and it was for the most horrible people. So accounts say that the distance between Tardis and Hades was the same as between the earth and beings and horrible criminals were. If Hades was the place of the dead, Tardis was where ferocious, evil beings and horrible criminals were banished and where lawyers actually end up in Tardis, I'm told. I, I'm sorry, moving on. And um, well, people need to lighten. They're just... Hand out chocolate. Ushers, uh, distribute the chocolate. I don't know what's going on here. Just chocolate for everyone. Will that make you happy? Tacos for this. Anyways, so they imprisoned their rivals after war, according to Greek mythology. The three judges of the underworld, Rhadamanus, Achaeus, and Minos, decided who would be in the realm of Hades and who would be banished to Tardis, according to Greek mythology. Moreover, Kronos, the king of the Titans, the giant people, the Nephilim, imprisoned the Cyclops and the Hectatrys in Tardis, but Zeus released them in order to defeat the Titans. Now, when the Titan, Titan, when all the Titans uh, ended in the favor of the Olympus, Zeus banished them to Titans, to Tardis, and punished mostly for being, for these beings were called Titans. Now, I said all that to say this. Titans were demigod offspring of celestial beings. Hercules was a titan, okay? The offspring of Satan referred to in Genesis 3. And we see that in many ancient cultures, there are similar stories. For example, all the Egyptian pharaohs of old believed they could trace their lineage to celestial beings and therefore were considered God on earth and would accept worship as such. Another example, you have the eight-foot god of the Persians in the movie 300. How many people saw 300? That's right. So the only time the Spartans, again, proved that as not only a football team, but as a people, they lose. Now, um, if they would have been Wolverines, that never would have happened. That's all I'm going to say. The Persians would have been annihilated. But we're going to let that go, okay? Wow. Rough crowd, bro. You you got my back? I don't get the truck started. eh? No sense of humor. That's right. What do people from Michigan State say to people of U of M? Welcome to McDonald's. Can I take your order? That's how it is. Go blue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Somebody give me some love in the crowd. So what I'm saying is, is these stories of these giant people are validated all throughout history. If you read the Iliad and the Odyssey, etc. If you read, if you don't, if you look on an app and Google it. Now, then you have Odinism. So let's just not stay in the Middle, uh, in, in, in the middle East. Um, the Vikings, they believe in Jotnar. Say Jotnar. Very good. Uh, these are giant gods represented by chaos and destruction who are in a constant state of war with the Asirs, which is Odin and Thor. How many people know who they are? No, it isn't that girl, that guy in the show. Now, some folks will say, well, see, you've just proven something that how can you be sure that the Bible and Enoch and all of this is true and they just didn't copy other people's stories, right? To which I always respond, how do you know that these other religions didn't copy from us? Remember, the oldest belief system 
in the world is Christianity. We always, we go all the way back to the first two people. <laughs> we win. Um, you hear other people like, well, no, that's I. And then you look at science, and science has proven that DNA goes all the way back to two people. Okay? And it was a male and a female. <laughs> it was not Adam and Eve, or Adam and Steve, or Eve and Evelyn, and the rest of the crew. It was two people married together. And, um, and they made babies, which... Some of you ask your mothers what that means. And, um, and then we have people, and that's how that happened. And yes, Adam and Eve's sons did have sex with their sisters. Uh, for those of you who are like, well, where do they get, you know, and people freak out. Well, eventually that stopped, and then the Noahic flood, and we kill all that, except for people who live in Tennessee. Now, <laughs> wow, that's not my fault. It's, it's a little, it's just, it's all right, Kentucky. I don't know. <laughs> where would you like to go? You need to lighten your people. are so tense. So, let me explain to you why we can follow scripturally where this comes from. There are no ancient manuscripts in all of the study of ancient literature, which, of course, I had to do. And I've actually, along with Pastor Chuck there, been to Israel and looked at them ourselves. Um, That is as authenticated as the Bible. It has more literary evidence than any other book ever written. Okay, it has the most literary validity of any piece of manuscript known to man with the most evidence of his authenticity, including going back to the Qumran scrolls, which we did meet the man whose grandfather found them. And we got to see actually one of the pots that they were in, which was very interesting. So that's a fact. Secondly, it has the largest following and more people have died for it than any other belief in history. Okay, now why would you die for something that's not real? Who does that? Okay. Third, people who read Michigan State, did you say? Muslim. Yeah, but they they haven't been around. We have more of us than there are of them. And we're still older than them. They came in at 632. That's when they actually wrote. Up to that point, they had all verbal uh, translation of the Quran. And, of course, there were no errors there. But we go back 2,000 years before Christ. So there was... The Muslims actually came in with their Quran at 632, so 6 plus 2. We are 2,600 years of written text before they ever came on the scene. They are a newbie. We go all the way back, back in the day, okay? We are the ultimate OG of God. Now, also, we have more people that have, of course, experienced miracles and life-changing experience through that, and later on today... Some of you here are going to get to experience that. Oh, yeah. But even after all this, it still does take faith to believe, and God gives that ability to all who desire to know him. See, a lot of people come into Christianity under the auspices that God owes you an explanation, as if you could understand it if he could even explain it to you. That is an assumption. Job tried that, and he said, okay, I will answer you when you tell me when do I feed all of the whales in all of the oceans, and which one, of course, are allergic to shrimp? Do you understand the whole concept of the universe? Do you understand when things happen? Do you know when to change a season? Do you know when to have a Indian summer just before you, of course, well, that you can't say that's not political, a Native American uh, summer? <laughs> I've got to be, it's, sermons are going to get really long trying to stay politically correct nowadays. Um, do you know when... And how many times a bee's wings need to flutter in order for it to elevate? Do you, do you, do you keep track of all of this? No, I barely remember where I put my keys. So sometimes when we try to challenge God, and not that God's against questions, and please, if you have any questions today at the Bible study, feel free. But there is a hubris, an arrogance that you don't come at God with because he will meet you at the level you want to meet him at. Okay? And that could be dangerous when your arms are too short to box with God. Can I get an amen from somebody who knows what I'm talking about? So, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Christianity is not a mental ascent, a philosophical belief, a religion, but it is actually an encounter with a living God. And this is the problem. There are many people in the church today, especially in America, who believe they're Christians, and they're not. What they are are fans, devotees, aficionados, historians of a 
person who they believe lived possibly. They like his ideas. They ascribe to some of his philosophical positions because they meld in with their thought process. But that doesn't mean that they're Christians. A Christian is someone who has a supernatural encounter with God. Salvation is supernatural. Jesus came from the fourth dimension. We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, kingdom, fourth, uh, as it is in heaven. If you have not had a supernatural experience, then I would question if you're saved. It's just that simple. Because it's not a religion. It's a love. And if you've never experienced that type of love, tonight is your opportunity. I have it on good, I'm telling you, like I'm 100% sure that God is ready to meet some people here today. And if I'm wrong, there is a money back guarantee. But if I'm right, perhaps you should pay me. There's things I think about, I don't know. I can't sell that stuff. All right, let's get back. Now, the 10th book of Enoch substantiates what Peter said in 2 Peter 2, for we read, the angels of God imprisoned their own brothers. So God used his angels to go imprison what was once angelic beings. For those who aren't hip to this, demons were never created. Demons were, of course, angels. Angels rebelled against with Satan and were thrown out of heaven. Okay, they have a free will from that perspective. The problem is free will is a lie. No one has a free will. I've said this before. You do not have free will, you have opportunistic will. Because if you exercise your will against God, it isn't free, it'll cost you your life. So it's not really free, that's a misnomer. Now, here's what happened. The flood came, wiped out humanity, but their eternal evil, unredeemed spirit lived after it left their body. So Enoch talks of this in Enoch 15. They will be called evil spirits and dwell on the earth to oppress man with sickness and trial and mental illness of attack on the mind. Now you say, well, where in the Bible is that talked of? Because I know many of you are good Baptists. Um, It doesn't say that. There is nowhere in Scripture that says that the Nephilim, after they were killed, became disembodied spirits. Okay, But the principle is talked of. So turn with me to Matthew 12, 43. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No. 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 Yes, sir. That's right. Right, Titans. They were spirit. They did not, they were not trichotomous. We are trichotomous because we're made in the image of God, body, soul, and spirit. Okay? They would be, from the idea of a spirit, a soul. In the Bible, you will hear those things become interchangeable, but if you understand the context of what they're speaking, they are not interchangeable. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Your spirit comes from God. Okay? That's why when you're saved, your spirit becomes saved. It is the eternal. So what happens here is is that their spirit and their soul were intertwined in such a fashion that they became evil spirits. But this is a term referring to, of course, the soul, because your soul is actually spiritual because that's what you're going to take with you to heaven. You don't take this with you, okay? It's who you are inside. Do you understand that? Are, are, you, are you with? Yes, yes, John. How do you differentiate between a spiritual experience and a non-spiritual experience? A spiritual experience is so specific that there is no doubt that you had it. God is so big, he doesn't go up there and go, well, I hope you understand what I'm saying. Has anyone found God to have a problem with communicating to you in a way that you understand? (laughs) Now, a few people here are grinning. They're like, no, no, actually, sometimes it's a little too clear. (laughs) 
Didn't have to get all crazy like that. It's a little too specific. Top roll. <clears throat> yes. That's what we're studying. Excellent. That's where we're going. Yes, I see that hand. Your name? But that's what we're doing. The, the, the principles of Enoch, Enoch is a non-canonical book, as I said. It is apocryphal in writing, like the book of Maccabees. Um, because it does not carry within it the scarlet thread of redemption. From Genesis to Revelation, the whole entire, all of them, speak of Jesus in one form or another. The apocryphal is more of a historical book but doesn't necessarily deal with the teaching or the principle of Jesus, but what happened to people who were following El Elohim. Of course, the first name God ever referred to himself to an Arab. Because remember, when God spoke to Abraham, he was from Ur of the Chaldees, he was a Chaldean. So he didn't speak Hebrew. But the first words that God referred to himself as to man in this situation, he said to El Elohim, he says, I am the keeper of covenants. And he spoke Hebrew to him. He didn't speak. So when you hear people say, well, Allah and they're all the same God. Uh, no, they're not. Allah is the moon God that the Muslims, remember 632, recycled from their pagan days. And, of course, by recycling these things, they then set up, if you go to Mecca in Medea, uh, in Saudi Arabia, as I've said, there's this big stone. How many people have seen the picture of the big stone with the black uh, curtain over it? You know why they covered it? Because there's all the pagan inscripts on it. And if you look down at the base, there's this large silver thing that actually looks like a vagina. And the, the whole fertility, do you, do you understand all of that? And inside of it is this piece of rock, which is, they believe came from the moon, and it's called Allah. So they believe God is a rock. Now to us, they say, yeah, but you have the cross, so you believe God is a cross. No, we believe he sat on a cross, or hung on a cross. You believe in the pagan philosophy that you recycled. Now, in fairness... The Christian faith, especially during Roman Catholicism, did recycle. When Constantine came in on the scene and he was going to rock the then known world with his, of course, uh, Theophanes' experience, uh, he saw a cross, he was fighting the Muslims, and people were like, see, the Crusaders did such evil, the same as the Muslims. Ah, ah, ah. No. The Crusades lasted 400 years. Why were there Crusaders? Because for 400 years, the Muslims had been attacking the Jews. And so eventually the Pope said, go over there and protect all the stuff with the Jesus stuff that we believe in. And while you're there, kill a bunch of people. And then when they started killing, there's a funny thing about war. It's very hard to stay moral when you're killing and you're doing the same exact thing your enemy is. And so what we found psychologically with human beings is, of course, um, they have to be trained to walk a very thin line. This is why a lot of our soldiers come back with PTSD and et cetera because they have to do some very heinous things. That's war, war is hell. That's why you don't want to go to war. That's why when Jesus comes, there'll be no war. So what happens is, is they started to, of course, get so far away from their commands, being all the way out there in Israel, um, and they were becoming rather bloodthirsty, etc. They were tired of getting killed. You see your guy, your buddies get hacked up, so you start to hack everybody else up. I had a cousin did the same thing. He was in Vietnam. They caught his buddy. They disemboweled him, cut off his genitalia, shoved them in his mouth. They caught the guys who did it and tortured them for 12 hours. That is common. Okay, I didn't say it's right. I didn't say all of our American soldiers did that. I didn't say any of those things. I'm saying that when the experience of war gets to a certain level of crescendo, and there's that much death and that much concentration of death and satanic behavior, that it can affect you. Does everyone understand what I just said? I am not anti-soldier. I support our troops 100% and proud to be American. Now, so what happens is this. The reason that they attacked the Muslims was because the Muslims were attacking the Jews. So for 300 years, this went down. No doubt. During this time, Constantine decides to go and win a war. Constantine goes over there, and Constantine then makes it 
law that everyone has to become a Catholic. Okay. Now, some of the people were pagan. So he said, well, how can I get them to ascribe to the Christian belief without it being too radical away from their pagan beliefs? So they found similarities, and he blended them within the Christian faith. For example, now if you get easily offended, practice forgiveness. Um, the Christmas tree is a totally pagan thing. Okay, if you look in Isaiah 11, who has Isaiah 11? Put up Isaiah 11, Jer I'm sorry, Jeremiah 11. Put the Jeremiah 10, Jeremiah 11, 10. I'll, I'll show you how this all goes down. Because my job, if you're here and you're a new person, is to offend you and educate you. Thank you. We're all, we like to practice forgiveness here, and so I offend you, and then you have to practice forgiveness, and it makes you closer to the Lord. It's just how we do it. Jeremiah 11.10. What is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Tinsel. Okay, so, Germanic tribes, give you some more history. The Germanic tribes were the Philistines. Germanic, Germans, Philistines came down, traveled down, brought that philosophy with them. This little light of mine, oh, Christmas tree and all of that is pagan. Now, you can do what you want to, okay? I'm just explaining to you. Well, I don't worship it. And then you all bow in front of it as you hand, put presents underneath it. And I always go, okay. We're Americans. If we don't believe it is something, it isn't. Because we're Americans. Doesn't matter if there's 4,000 years of history. I don't want to believe it. Yoga. Those positions, those are just stretches. And all the Hindu people say, yes, thank you very much. Because <laughs> those are 333 million positions in which you're worshiping our gods. Okay. And people are like, no, I don't believe in that. I just like to wear the pants. Um, it's just how people are. I mean, where would we be without yoga today? We wouldn't have pants. <clears throat> Although it doesn't really look like pants, it just looks like it's a naked woman with no underwear walking around in fuchsia. Whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's just, I don't know. It's just, and some people, just because you can doesn't mean you should. You know what I'm saying? It's like me in a thong. I don't do it. It's just, I can, I shouldn't. The point is, they started to ascribe things. Halloween became this Christian holiday. Okay? Study Halloween. It has never been a Christian holiday. <laughs> it's a satanic holiday. So what we did was we started to ascribe certain parts so that we could get people to feel comfortable in the church. We started to compromise with their pagan belief systems so that we could draw people into the church. I'll let that preach for those of you who want to go with that. Okay. So that's what he did. So he did the very same thing that he was fighting against. Now, this is not a slam on the Roman Catholics because I got saved through the Roman Catholic charismatic kumbaya days, and so God bless them. I'm not saying it. I'm just saying that there are, in any religious belief systems, flaws throughout history, and if you're ashamed of that or you're afraid to embrace the fact that there are flaws within historical positions, then, of course, you're not really being genuine about what you believe in. Okay? It's just the way it is. It is what it is. America has not always done everything perfect either. Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> just thought I'd freak you out. Matthew 12, 43. We're going to back up this whole principle of disembodied spirits. Always have scripture. Matthew 12, 43. When an evil spirit leaves a person, hello? When it leaves a person, it goes into the desert seeking rest but finds none. Say disembodied. Then it says, it says, it verbalizes, I will return the person I came out of. So it returns and it finds its former home empty, swept, and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. 
And so the person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of the last evil generation. This is, of course, after Noah, so that would be the generation just before Jesus returns, which would be now. Mark 3, 26 through 27. Let's look there. Again, Scripture validates Scripture. I had someone say to me, they came to me with a problem, they're like, I have this question, I want your opinion, but I don't want you to give me any Bible answer. I just want you to give me your opinion. I said, do you really want that opinion? I think you're stupid. That's my opinion. And I think you're probably going to go to hell, too. That was my opinion. So it's better to stick to the Bible and God, because I, I don't really like people as a whole, so I try to stay with the God thing. That way nobody can accuse me of being racist. I hate everyone equally. Oh, y'all get on my nerves. That's just how it is. How many people know what I'm I like my dog. Dogs are the best. How many dog people here? How many cat people here? Oh, you're going to hell. Anyways, I can't believe you walked into that. That was, I just, that's terrible. That's, that was a joke. You need to relax. Everybody lighten up. People get so offended about their cats. Everybody wants to have a pet that sticks its butthole in your face while you're petting it. That's just, that says love. I don't understand the whole concept. It's a filthy animal. Anyway, where was I? She, Jocelyn says, no, that was a little far. She said it was a little far. That's, she's because she has a cat. Mark 3, 26 through 27, it says, If Satan is divided and rises against himself, he cannot stand, and his end has come. Indeed, no one can enter a strong man's house. The same word strong man here is the same word as mighty man, which is where we get the idea of Nephilim or Titan. Here's the problem with Americans, and I am one. We read the King James or the New Living or the Message, (laughs) seriously, uh, or the Living or whatever, and we actually believe that Jesus spoke English. The books were written in Greek and Hebrew with the Greek and Hebrew culture. Everything doesn't translate. And so when you try to take your American mindset and put it onto a Middle Eastern book, you will have problems. Okay, so it says you enter a strong man's house, a place he dwells or has a habitation. Again, referring back to Matthew 12, talking about an evil spirit. If you're going to steal his possessions or free someone, unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can plunder the house or you can, of course, free someone. This is why when we do exorcisms here or deliverance or whatever word you're comfortable with, We bind the strong man in their life because when I'm doing an exorcism or deliverance or whatever word you're comfortable with or uncomfortable with, one of the first things we do is we bind the strong man who is the cheese or the boss over that person. Once the strong man is bound and we cast him out, all of the other ones usually are easy to remove whenever we do exorcisms and they come out rather easy because of that, because he's the kingpin. Because contrary to the American mindset, which says, I can just do what I want, even demons have to submit to bigger and higher demons. That's why the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness. There's your hierarchical order. There are demons that actually are in charge of atmospheres. Go, leave, go to Florida, come back, and land in Detroit, and tell me what you feel if you've been gone for a week. If you're halfway spiritual, you'll go, oh, Okay, that's just how it is. And I love Detroit and have ministered in Detroit for years, but there are demonic presences. Why? What do we have that is one of the largest in the world? We have the Masonic Temple. That is correct. That is Satanist. 33rd degree. Jesus was 33rd degree. 33rd he died. They mock that. The Masonic Temple, the G is God. You are God within yourself. Mystery religion, it's a cult, it's satanic. Now you say, well, I know really good Christians that are part of the Masonic Temple. Yes, but they're not 33rd degree Masons. They're probably no higher than 10 or 12, and then they've stopped. When you get to the 17th degree, part of the secret cult is that you say, you evoke the name Apollyon over yourself. Look in Revelations, who is Apollyon? That's Satan. You're actually asking him to be your guardian angel. 
okay? Look it up. Remember, anything I say, look it up, look it up, look it up. If you get offended by not researching it, that's your fault. If you research it, you get offended, that would be my fault. If you get researched and you learn, I did my job. Okay, that is what it is. Now stop everyone and listen for the black helicopters. Okay, we're good, we can keep going. <laughs> they, they, it was obviously not pressed out. Uh, back to Detroit. Take a look at what happened in Detroit um, and why I believe in the demonic spirit. I don't believe in him, but that there are demonic spirits in Detroit. First of all, we are the murder capital of the world, although Chicago and their great gun control program is causing them to, of course, chase us severely because there are no guns here in Chicago, so now they have become the murder capital. We are just the most violent crime capital. Okay, yes, sir. He's like, you what? Yes, well, they, they still have Devil's Night, and then, of course, the chief of police said, stop burning down all of these buildings, because that would be a good idea, and... Um, We'd rather pay $20,000 to have a demolishing company and tax everybody to death. Just things I think about. You know what I'm saying? They were burning crack houses and burning up abandoned homes, which saved you. Yeah, it was Coleman Young. Well, it was actually the chief of police who tried that. But here we go. So here's how this goes. We have, number one, the Masonic Temple. Number two, you have a very large satanic church, not too far down the road from that. Number three, in 1940, we have, of course, that whole walkout with the racism position in which the white people said, we're not going to work with black people in the big three, which, of course, is the automotive industry. So that brought a spirit of racism, which was then manifest in 67, in which I was there at the riots, hidden underneath a couch while my parents protected the door with guns so we wouldn't get shot. And then we moved on up to the east side, further up and away from the drama. This caused some bitterness also. Or if you don't want to use the word riot because you feel it's not politically correct to use the word riot, uprising. Call what you'd like. So you have murder going on, you have drugs, you have the Masonic Temple, you have the Satanists, you have the two riots and the racism that came from that. Then, of course, what did you say about that? What about it? Oh, yes. And then Mayor Coleman Young went and gave the keys of the city to a guy named Saddam Hussein. Now, Saddam Hussein was from this place called Iraq. And the thing about Iraq and Iran in the Bible is that's called what? Babylon. And since he was in charge and the cheese of that, he gave authority to a Babylonian spiritual individual because he is an authority and all authority, of course, is established by spiritual principles. Okay? Okay. So he gave the key of the city to someone we later hung. Well, they hung their own. Then, of course, we have Dearborn. And um, if you're politically incorrect, I'm sorry, but I read the Quran unless you do. I challenge you not to challenge me. Um, and they brought, of course, the Muslims. Now, the reason why the Muslims are here is because there was a guy who made a car known as what? The Model A. Mr. Ford was an anti-Semite. He hated Jews, and so he brought all the Muslims over there because he was hating, of course, the Jews who were in power in Detroit at the time. And um, so he brought the whole Dearborn situation in. By the way, he was also a Mason. Um, and, of course, they brought in Muslims, and that's why we do have terror cells that are down in Dearborn. If you don't believe me, I can introduce you to some of my FBI friends, and they will just laugh at you. Now, the Muslim faith, of course, is not a faith in God or in Jesus, so it is a cult faith. Anything that is not Jesus is wrong. It's that simple. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. All roads lead to heaven no matter what religion, but only one lets you stay. <laughs> Everybody else just keeps heading on down the road. Jesus is kind of exclusive. He's just like that. Now, so you have the Muslims here and all that's going on there. You have the racism that's going on here. You have the Masonics that are going on here, the Satanic, the drugs, and then, of course, what Mr. Ford did. This all draws demonic spirits. How do we know? Let's talk about spiritual principles. When the praises go up from here, from Christians coming together, who comes down? That's right. So 
Any form of worship or behavior draws a demonic presence over that situation. I'll give you an example. How many people have seen, say, a young male um, playing a violent video game and then find his disposition to be slightly not Jesus-like? Has anyone here ever messed with a Ouija board and found that the atmosphere in the home got a little creepy? Okay. All right. These are just principles. You can say, well, I don't believe in that. That's all right. The next time I do an exorcism, I will invite you. But if you poop on my couch, you have to clean it. And you have to explain to me what that was. Because <laughs> that can happen. Any questions with the whole history of Detroit and why that happened? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes, they did. And we have even a couple of Muslims running for governor, which we are praying against. People are like, no, that's just not right. And I'm like, and you're a little slow. Okay? Let me explain some things to you since you don't know nothing. You're an American. And you think because you're American and you can say it that that means that 4,000 years of history or 2,000 years of history, we dismiss because we're Americans and we want to be open to everyone, but we lock our doors and we lock our car doors. Why? Let anybody just steal from you. What's the problem? You have bigots. Thieves are people too, you know. Maybe they just identify as long-term borrowers. <laughs> The only religion that says we are looking for world domination, world domination, and we Americans go, well, come on in. <laughs> God bless your heart. You come on over here. I know this is crazy, but back there was a number years ago, and this used to mean something. A couple of towers fell. Now, you can say that's an inside job if you'd like to. That's fine. The Muslims still, I have friends who lived in Dearborn, said that many of the Muslims went into the streets. There were thousands in the streets jumping up and down when that happened. They were quite excited. And if you go during the Muslim festival, I don't recommend you do, but some people there um, actually follow a form of Muslim where they punish themselves. There are two forms. Well, there's lots of forms, but two main ones. Uh, there is Sunni and Shia, and I believe it is the Sunni who will actually cut themselves, or they will take their kids and they will cut their kid's head to show remorse, okay? So that's why you have the black um, turban and the white turban. Again, anything I say, research it. Don't research it, okay? Anything I say, okay? Don't ever take anything anybody says point blank unless you watch CNN and NBC and NBC. Uh oh, and Fox, let's not be. <laughs> Come on now. I mean, don't play me. So, um, you know, I'm not saying that all Muslims are here to destroy us. I would never say that. I have ate with Muslim people and talked with Muslim people, and I don't have a problem with that. What I'm trying to tell you is that people who truly follow the Muslim faith are out to dominate this country because they say so. Not because I say so, because they say so. Okay? That's just facts. Sorry if that hurts your American view of life. But that is reality, and I read the Quran. Get yourself one. Read it. Go to an imam, and he'll lie to you. Why? Because in the belief, there is a thing called tashid which means that a Muslim can lie to anyone who is not a Muslim because you don't deserve the truth. And this is why they have broken all of their treaties. Because they can. Because you don't deserve the truth. Now, again, does that mean that we should hate all Muslims? No, we pray for them that they come to Jesus. Does that mean we should not help them and love them and care for them and when they come here legally, um, embrace them and invite them to church and feed them if they need it and if... All of those things. We're not supposed to not be Jesus. But at the same time, we do not want to assimilate into their religious view because there is no difference between their religion and their politic. Only in America do we do that. Okay. Yes? Yes? 
in some, not in Turkey, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. They, uh, they imprisoned that uh, Christian pastor, and then uh, Uncle Donald had to go threaten them. If you don't give us our guy back, we'll blow you up. And then, <laughs> Sorry, it was a bad example. Um, not in Egypt. Oh, no, no. In Egypt, they just had that, of course, that civil war in the Kesika. Not in Yemen. No, no, Yemen. No, that's no. Yemen's a bad example. In Yemen, they... Um, in India, no, I just watched them burn a 14-year-old girl to death uh, with gas. And, uh, no. In... Moving on. People need Jesus, no matter what religion they follow. They need Jesus. Don't believe the lie, kids. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't take the red pill. Be like Eo. Take the blue pill and enter into the real world. No one can enter a strong man's house unless he binds him. So according to Barnes' notes on the scripture, the occasion of their saying was this, that Jesus had healed a man possessed of an evil spirit in Mark 3.26. And so Jesus was addressing the idea of binding a strong man or a mighty man, a Nephilim. Okay? Now remember, Ephesians 6.12 says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And then according to John 4.4, 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Who's the them? Satan's seed, because he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. But he tells you that you're not greater, and that's why you have the problems that you do with your Christianity, because you believe the devil. Why? If it goes contrary to this Bible, why do you believe it? Why? The Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. God even gave us a manual. because That's why there's more women in the church than men, because women will read it, and men are like... Oh, I, don't know. I don't know. We'll figure it out. That's how men are. Manual. That's the first thing we throw away when you open a box, you know. Gone. We'll figure it out. We're dudes. We're Americans. And then, yes, and then the women have to get out of the garbage and remind us that there's a warranty you have to send in. And that would mean we have to use words instead of grunts. And that's never any good. So we just ignore that stuff. So let's get on with our study. That was just the intro. No. We battle demonic spirits. Matthew eleven twelve 12 says, The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, where we are from, but the violent take it by force. Notice it doesn't say by ignorance, pacificity, or political correctness, or putting your head in the sand. Now, how can he attack us? Proverbs 26. I'm going to show you how Satan attacks your life. It says, As the bird by wandering, 26 2, as a bird by wandering, as a swallow by flying, so a curse without a cause shall not come alight. Now, in Genesis 9, 20, it says, Now Noah began to be a farmer. I'm going to show you. Remember, they were all cast down. Okay? They were cast down. And yet, how did they come back? Who gave them access to this world? Well, who gave Satan access to the garden? Adam, man brings demons into communities, into their lives, into their family, mankind. Okay, that's how it works. We draw it. Okay, now watch. So here's what happened with Noah. Noah was a farmer and he planted a vineyard. This was before Ernest and Julia, the original Moke and David. I know. Then he drank the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of the Canaanites, saw the nakedness of his father and he told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment laid it on both of their shoulders, went backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. Now, so what? I mean, i got to be honest with you. My brother and I, along with my pops, we walked around our tidy whities all day. You know what I'm saying? That's just, that's just how it was. You know what I'm saying? 
see dad naked or uh, another guy naked. We didn't really care. This was before you had to be concerned about things like that. Um, so we, you know, why make a big deal? I saw you saw your dad naked. You know, that's, that just shows you that, you know, that's what you'll look like in 30 years. And so you can get depressed or whatever you want to do with that. From the back, I look like my whole family. From the front, I look like my dad. So what I found is it was no big deal, right? So, so what? Well, here's the problem. There's more to this. Look what happened. Noah awoke from his wine, knew that his younger, what his younger son had done to him. How would he know? When someone looks at you, can you always tell if you're asleep and passed out and drunk? So then, how did he know? Then he said to him, cursed. Now you say, well, that's no big deal. No, stop being an American. This is a Middle Eastern book. You don't curse your own children. Matter of fact, Jews, you know why they're so successful? An Orthodox Jew, when you have dinner, at the end of the dinner, your father will read the Bible over you, and he lays hands on you, and he blesses you after every meal. Fact. So you don't curse. That's a big no-no. See, in America, if a teacher can't teach your kid, you go and you blame the kid. What's the matter with you? Why can't you learn what the teacher's saying? If you're Jewish, you go and blame the teacher. Why can't you teach my kid? My kid is wonderful. No, this is their thinking. This is the mindset. Jewish people don't have identity issues and low self-esteem. <laughs> if your dad is always laying his hand on you, saying you're great, you're going to be awesome, God's going to bless you, everything you touch is going to be blessed, you're going to be blessed coming in, you're going to be blessed coming out, and he keeps speaking the, the, the Shema Israel over you, and he steeps, and every time you have a meal and he provides for you, and here this person who's providing food for you is also speaking a spiritual blessing over you, you think you're probably going to feel pretty good about yourself. So understand, Americans, that when he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of his servants, he shall be even to his brethren. That's pretty low. And he says, So Noah cursed all of Ham's descendants forever. All because he looked at him naked? Ham uncovered his father. So what he did was he brought on a curse. Now, to uncover in the Bible is related to homosexuality or perversion of sexual God-given intent, sex outside of God's design, like the Nephilim did. The Nephilim were angels. These angels were not supposed to have sex with people. They were supposed to guard them. This is why pedophilia is such a terrible thing, because adulterers protect children. Now they're saying all love is fair and it's okay if they're five. Men should be able and women should be able to have sex with children. Now, if that offends you, you're a narrow minded bigot, according to people who live in California and the LGBT community. That's a fact. Again, anything I say, research it for yourself. They've always been trying to go for pedophilia. Okay? The majority of any time homosexuality is practiced in bars, there is always pedophilia associated with that. They always make room for that. Okay? In Muslim countries, although they say they're against it, in Egypt, there are whole districts where you can go and buy children to have sex with. That is a fact. In Yemen, they have boys that dress up like girls because there's not a lot of women in, that, or in Afghanistan, I'm sorry. And so they have boys that dress up and they all go to these parties and they make money sodomizing these young boys who dance and they even sing and everything else. Okay? So, when you have sex outside of God's intention, you draw a demonic influence. Because when men and women come together in sexuality, okay, and they intertwine themselves. The Bible says the two become what? One flesh. Do they actually become one flesh? What is he referring to? They're becoming one. Her last name is the same as his last name. 
One. We call ourselves Christians. Jesus is the Christ. When you're born again, we technically have communion, which is a form of the honeymoon night in which virginity is lost, if you will. Blood is shed when they had a woman has a hymen in the blood, the communion, but we use Jesus' blood because ours would have been impure. And of course, you're taking his body, take my body into you. Remember, everyone was offended at what Jesus said, and many of his disciples left him because he said that. They were offended when he said, when you, how many, do we have any Catholics that remember? Take my body into you, this is, okay. Well, what is he saying? Okay, so understand something. This is a spiritual principle. This is not physical. Everyone's freaking out. Don't freak out. This is, don't, don't be American. We're, we're trying to talk spiritual principles. The two become one flesh. The Bible says that the wedding bed is undefiled, or it's a sterile environment. So sur- spiritual surgery is going on between the two of them. But if you have bacteria, because this is not a sterile environment, like going and me going and doing kidney surgery over here at the Marathon gas station on the bathroom floor, no matter how good of a surgeon I am, how many people are down for that? Obviously, people have been to that Marathon station. You know what I'm saying? Probably not down for that, especially the men's room, because their aim is bad. Okay, anybody want me to go start cutting it? You don't. You'll get infected. Infected with what? This type of behavior draws a spiritual experience. Okay. If it is done under the auspices of the marriage bed unto the Lord, this is actually a form of praise unto God. Look it up. Read the middle of the Bible called the Song of Solomon. Okay. This behavior draws God's blessing on the union. John, I'll explain that all, all this stuff to you later. Ask him. He'll explain to you where birds and bees are. Yeah, he'll get back to John later. It draws God's anointing when it is done in love under God's auspices. Because any adults have a problem with that statement. Okay. If you don't do this the way God says, what do you draw then? Think. Proof. When two people come together outside of God's plan, okay, what usually happens to your first sexual experience? And please don't give me some outlier. The majority of the time, it ends up in what? Divorce. 70% of the people who have sex before marriage today, 80% if they live together, end up in divorce. Satan goes about to destroy relationships. He goes out like a seek, he goes out to seek and devour. Okay, to destroy relationships, especially relationships that represent husband and wife. Does anyone know why? Because Jesus is coming back for his bride, feminine genitive, and he is the groom, male genitive. So when a husband and wife come together, they are actually declaring what is going to happen in the end times when Jesus comes back for his church. Every wedding is a declaration of Jesus coming back. So it is magnifying God. So that's why Satan looks to destroy marriages and families, binary families. Okay, why? Because they declare what is the purpose of marriage. Adam and Eve, and Adam is called the first, or Jesus was called the second Adam. Because he's coming back for his bride, Eve, the church. That's what marriage is. That's why homosexual marriage, which is not a marriage, it's a homosexual union. And if they legally want to do that according to the government, I don't care. But they're not going to tell me to ask God to bless something that God doesn't bless because it will misrepresent what Jesus is going, what history was all about. Jesus the Messiah coming back for his bride. You jack up the whole story. I'm not going to stand before God and jack up the whole story. Can you imagine? God looks at me. You had one job, Al. One job. Can't even get that right. Well, I was under pressure. Whatever. Or whatever. However they do that nowadays. So what I'm saying to you is this. That is the purpose of marriage. It has always been Christ and his church. 
So intimacy, which is, you hear prayers called Catholics, ejaculations, small little prayers, the passion of Christ, all of these words are not perversions, but they are all to be pointing to the return of Jesus. Being born again, how are you born? Sexuality. So Satan doesn't want to have a bunch of people born because they have a guardian angel, so he has abortion, so that the guardian angel is, is, is disqualified from the process. If you kill them all, then he feels he might have to not contend with as many angels or people who have dominion over him because we've been given dominion through Christ. Think, people. It's, it's right here. It's, it's, it's in the book. You really should get one of these things. They're amazing if you read them. It's, it's, it's. Satan attacks sexuality to make it perverse because then we won't look at this from the purity of what it's supposed to be. Jesus, the groom, will come for his bride. He won't come for one Christian. He'll come for his church. So for those of you who are not in church regularly and claim to be Christians, you may not make it. He's not coming back for people who said, I agree with you, but I'm not going to do it your way. He's funny like that. God's so arrogant, he thinks he's God. <laughs> he is. Your opinions, your feelings mean nothing. This is what gets you in through a relationship with Jesus Christ. There are no errors. I have looked. I'm 51 years old. I have read this through 53 times, and I have studied it in Hebrew and in Greek and have all of the interpretations except the message because that's ridiculous in the contemporary version because Jesus didn't talk like that. I've studied this book looking for errors purposely. Never found them. Never. I dare anyone to challenge me on this. I'll take on anybody you want. Matter of fact, go get a professor. I love atheists, guys. Bring them by. I won't even argue with them. I just shove my gun in their mouth. They're going, oh my God! <laughs> See, I won. It's, didn't even have to argue. It'll sound more like, because the gun's in their mouth. But the point is, you'll get it. You know. Think about it. The church has to go back to reading the Bible and thinking and listening to what the Bible says. It is not open to your feelings, your conjecture, your idea of right and wrong. The Bible is not the good book. The good book says if a guy punch you in the face, yeah, you could punch him back. Jesus didn't say that. Don't claim you're a Christian if you don't believe this 100%. You're not going to make it. The Bible says so. That's what the Bible says. If you have a problem with that, do me a favor. Tonight, get on your knees, dial 1-800-GOD, and talk about it with the guy who wrote it. Complain to him, please. I don't agree with the way you do things. I've done it myself. That pastor that you have over that church, he's terrible. He should never be in the ministry. That's what I said. I'll go with you tonight. I'll kneel right next to you. Yeah, you heard what she said. I told you this was a bad plan. And he doesn't care. God gets what he wants. I just talked to a man today. I said, why don't you come to church? He says, ah, eh, you know, I don't want to come to church. He says, you will go to church. He says, I'll never go to church. He says, no, that's not true. Everyone goes to church. You either come in horizontal or vertical. <laughs> but I always get the last word over you. Trust me. <laughs> it's better to come in this way than this way because they wheel you in. And then I got to lie. Yeah, maybe at the last second they might have thought about something that was Jesus-related. They might have repented. Maybe I hope so. And meanwhile, people are like, I won't see that loved one again. And they want me to lie. There is no hope outside of Jesus Christ. There is no other word besides this. And the Bible says if you add to this, you are accursed. So much for the Mormons. Their Bible is that thick. They add extra stuff. Yes. Yes, sir. That is what they're saying. I'm going to prove it. Thank you. Um, Matter of fact, Leviticus 18.6 is where I'm going. It says, none of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him, 
to uncover his nakedness. That is the same exact word for what Ham did to Noah. It says, the nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. Same word. And if you read on the verse, it goes into detail of everyone you're not supposed to have sex with. So any sort of sex, which is a form of a spiritual union outside of God's plan for man and woman because it represents Christ in the church, draws demonic. Yes, I am saying that homosexuals are demon-possessed people. Transgender people have mental illness. If that's what you want to call it, they're possessed. Pedophiles, if you have sex with a child, you are demon-possessed. And as an exorcist, I know all about it because I've been doing it for 25 years. But the hope is Christ. He's the answer. Yes. Yes. The race? You know, I never got into that. I have some people that try to stretch it and say Ham was black, and he came from Cain, and he was marked. And so Cain was marked, and so it's black people. But then all black people would have to be gay. Nope. Nope, that one isn't. That one is, is definitely not. He, he, he knew where I was headed immediately, too. I had to pick the darkest one in the room. There he is. Now there's the second dark. How are we doing on the homosexual front there, Brother Chris? Nope, he's not down for it either. So that kind of shoots that in the pants. So I, I never bought that into that whole idea. You know, they're, well, black people are cursed and everything else. And that's why slavery came about is because they were under a curse. And I have heard other people say that because Africa... When it was first introduced, remember, who was, what was the color of the individual who carried the cross for Christ? Does anyone know? Serene. Yeah. So he was what? He, he was brown. Okay. And he started later, did you know that he started a church? Are we aware of this? Do you know that you have a massive Africa? And which is a continent, not a country. Please don't offend Sudanese people and call them Kenyan because that's bigotry. But when God came, uh, one of the oldest churches in the world is the Coptic church in Egypt, which is Africa. Um, and in so doing, they're the first in the originals, and they're the real deal. So before everybody gets all <laughs> white people, I tell people this all the time, we didn't come in on the scene in the Bible until the last 25% when Paul went off to Macedonia. We were rather insignificant. The point is, why would God build the oldest church based on the Coptic church, which is, of course, brown people? To prove, I think, that theory, that's not true. They're not cursed. Okay. He actually was, the, he was there to carry. And people say, see, that was slavery. I can't stand ignorance. He was given an opportunity to help Save the world. Without the cross, what do we have? We're most miserable. So God used a woman and a black man to change the world. <laughs> there goes the neighborhood. I don't know how else white people ever make it. Because, see, this is the nonsense. People don't seem to read the Bible. God has never been in his skin tone because John says that when I saw the bride of Christ coming down, I saw every race and color and skin tone and pigmentation. And yet they all had one blood, his blood. We've got to understand the unity of the church. Well, we're way out there today, buddy, so I don't think so. <laughs> Go right ahead. We're on a thin line. I will tell you. I will tell you. 
Um, he, I will repeat the question. He said, what keeps people from reading the word? Great pastors like myself who tell them all they need to know. You laugh, but think about it. How many people actually read their Bible and how many people just go to church? I mean, be on the real. Well, he's got his doctorate. He'll tell us what I need to know. I'm good. A manual? Mm, I'll figure it out. People say knowledge is power. Knowledge is not power. Wisdom is power. But you can't get wisdom without knowledge. To know him in the fellowship of his suffering, Paul said. So that means knowing at a deeper level than mental ascent, you actually personalize it if you suffer while you're studying it. <laughs> okay? Because now you've got skin in the game. If you just read it and it's just about somebody else, it makes no difference. But if you have to personalize it, then it holds you accountable and nobody wants to be held accountable. See, people come to me when they're first saved and they're like, I want to be a Christian. I want to be a better Christian. And so I say, well, you're going to have to stop doing this in your life and, and God's going to have to deal with that in your life and you have a call on that life and there's parts of your life that's going to have to change. And they're like, well, what do you know? You're not perfect. And I'm like, mm-hmm. So then why did you ask me? If people could figure it out on themselves, why did God give apostles, pastors, prophets, teachers, and evangelists for the perfecting of the saints? If you could be perfect on your own, what do you need me for? You can't. You need me. You need pastors, apostles, pastors, prophets, teachers, and evangelists. The Bible says so. Why would God have human beings submit to a human being who's not perfect? Why would God do that? Does anyone know? Iron sharpens iron. That's very good. What would be another reason why... A man as, as foolish as myself, and the Bible says God used the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So if you feel very that I'm foolish, it means you're really wise. Um, why would he do that? Yes, ma'am. Well, whoever did an act of sacrifice and submitted to something they didn't agree with. Some guy named Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. Yeah, but you're not perfect. Absolutely not. I'm, I, you know why God made me a pastor? Because I would have split hell wide open and scared the hell out of the devil. That's how bad I was. And God was like, oh, son, um, the only way you're going to make it by my grace is for me to put you in a situation where you have to be about me all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week or you will never make it. And so in his mercy, he said, I'm going to give you the easiest job on the planet. You only work two days a week. That's what they sold me in the brochure, but I'm going to, I'm going to sue somebody on that. So not only was sexuality, it wasn't homosexuality that just drew the sin. It was sex outside of God's intended plan because God said, do not have sex with your dad. Do not have sex with your mom. Don't have sex with children. Don't have sex with your own children. Don't do that because it is not what I want. It will draw demonic Nephilimic spirits that will mutate from children. And when you're born under these type of curses, you birth a bastard child, which means they are not blessed by the blessing of God. They're under a curse that has to be broken, which Jesus can do. But you draw this. It draws a demonic presence. If we go back to Detroit, do you know how many fatherless children are in Detroit? <laughs> We're fighting that spirit here too. And please, if you're a single mother, don't get all, we have Jesus, he can heal all. What we're saying is, is that that behavior draws it draws behavior. If you give somebody the middle finger, have you ever found that it never draws a, God bless you, good to see you, hope to see you in church. Let me pray for you. God bless your heart. They never do that. What does it usually bring? A rather visceral response that is not godly. Behavior draws demonic influence. It also draws spiritual influence. Worshiping God draws Jesus. Worshiping Satan draws Satan. 
And one of the highest forms of worship, God's intention, was Christ and his church, the bride. And so if you do this and you're sending a false message, you're going to draw a false god, Satan. Yes, sir, I see that hand. Brother Derek, you can kind of set that up. Marijuana dealer. Let us smoke a little Kush. Wonder where that word came from. So by partaking in something, you can also draw spirits. You say, prove that. No problem. Proverbs 23, 29. It says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Remember, that was the things that the Nephilim were supposed to do to mankind. We just read that. It says, who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine and who go to the samples of bowl of mixed wine, that's harder booze. It says, don't gaze at wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it goes down smoothly. In the end, it bites like a snake, demon, and poisons like a viper. So not only was he participating in homosexuality, but being drunk or being involved in narcotics will also take you into the fourth dimension and draw demonic influence. When people want to become possessed, I've said this a million times, you want to become a witch doctor, you take pharmacia, pharmaceuticals. You shut yourself up in your cave, you would listen to certain kinds of music, chant certain nihilistic things, wouldn't eat for three days, four days, five days, and then become possessed. How do young people become possessed today? They do heroin, they do all kinds of drugs, listen to nihilistic music, shut themselves up in their bedroom, their caves, don't eat for days, come out, totally different person, totally possessed. That's how it works, ladies and gentlemen. Your behavior draws. That's what this is about. Jesus says, the wine of the spirit, not the wine of man. Jesus says, I'm coming back for my bride, not my other groom. Do you, do you understand? People are so arrogant. You, you, we really believe like the world is about human beings. There were stuff way before us. Angels and demons, celestial beings, principalities and powers. The Bible says all of creation is watching God's process in some form of mental acquiescence. Even the mountains, it says, will bow and tremble. And it's just a rock. Even a, anything that is created will always respond to God. That's why the Bible says in the end times, when man is going against God, there will be storms and earthquakes, 42 volcanoes on the planet right now, <laughs> all erupting. What a coincidence. Things you don't hear about too much. Massive floods. Diseases we can't stop, plagues we can't control, widespread famine, war. In the last 200 years, we have had more catastrophes, worldwide catastrophes, than ever in world history. Yet people say, oh, it's not the end times. He's, we've got lots of time. Okay. Wake up, ladies and gentlemen. The church is not paying attention. And it's very important that we do. Because the Bible says Jesus is coming back who are looking for his appearing, not who are listening to cute little messages about how you're a victim and just love your neighbor and I'm okay and you're okay. That's nonsense. 
Know your enemy. Satan is real. He's looking to destroy you. It is your job on this Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise, to do the impossible because with God, all things are possible. Any questions? Is anyone offended? Ah, finally, thank you, Chuck. I have one. That was really hard. I worked very hard. I thought I'd at least get one. Everyone else was like, no, it was great. You know where liars go, don't you? <laughs> Michigan State. But the point is, that's okay. It's, you go blue <laughs> or go home. But the point is, yes, I see that hand in the back, ma'am. Someone has a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Misused. Misused narcotics. Misused narcotics. Remember, misused sex does not bring on demons if it's done properly. Okay. Okay. I was doing so good. I, I had him, and then, and then, I'm going to do deliverance tonight. Just lock the doors. We're going to have, we're going to be here. Well, get the oil, guys. I'm going to need a gallon. I guess some of you have had some bad experiences. I'm sorry to hear that. Maybe it was the wine. Um, anything misused, okay, not under God's direction. Okay, can become that. I had my hip replaced um, about f five years ago. And they use power tools. What they do is they actually dislocate your hip and they make an incision on me right about here. And they popped it out so that my femur bone and, of course, uh, the socket popped out the hole. Okay, then they took a power tool saw and they sawed off the top of it. And then they threw my leg across me like this, and they pressed the bone up through the hole, and then they ran a spike down in it with a hammer, and they banged it in there. And then they opened up all the muscle tissue, um, and then they slid it back and popped it in there after they drilled out the inside of my socket, and then they put like an adhesive in there, and then they put a cup in there with ceramic, and then they drilled in there some screws, and then they popped it all back. When I woke up, they said, would you like Oxycontin? Oxycodone, and I said, I'll take Motrin. Now, granted, I am an extremely tough person or a dumb numbutt, whatever. Just a, he's a numbutt, so he doesn't. I wasn't going to put myself in that position, but I will tell you, if you have that surgery or something like that and you use a narcotic I would only use that narcotic as long as it took until I could sustain. So what I took was Tylenol 3s at night. That was the only thing I said. I'll have some Tylenol 3s. And I said, I want seven of them. I gave myself seven days to acclimate to the pain. I sought the Lord that he would give me rest supernaturally to override any of the pain so that I wouldn't put myself in a position where I could become addicted to the substance. And guess what? The 10th day from having my hip replaced, I was shooting in a cowboy competition. And God did the miraculous and freaked out my surgeon. Oh, and I was painting this church and the new house all in the same way. Do not have your hip replaced and clothes on a house and a 15,000 square foot building that you have to paint. It's a little bit of information. But how did I do it? With God, all things are possible. Don't be afraid to exercise your faith over the natural. You're supernatural. You're an immortal. You're never going to die. Don't be afraid. Okay? So tonight, I want to pray for a few people who need a touch from God in the area of the supernatural, who have been going through some things and want God to manifest to them because of the cynicism, not of what I preach today, but because you're struggling with doubt. And so I want to pray for those people here. There are other people 
Uh, the Lord told me today that we were going to have a foot washing. Now, for those of you who aren't hip to that, there's this guy named Jesus, very hip guy. Um, and just before he died, he washed his disciples' feet. And the reason for that is, is because what they had walked through in their life up to that point had accumulated things to their feet that he didn't want to be attached to them after he resurrected. So if you've walked in some places you ought not to have walked, maybe you've stepped in some things in your life that perhaps are still sticking to your shoe, kind of like a good farm field in Kentucky, and you need to kind of remove some of the crap that you've walked through in your life, then we'd like you to come up here and allow our ministers to pray for you and to wash your feet. Now, if you have a foot thing, get over it. I don't know everybody has them. Um, but this is not about your feet. This is more of a spiritual thing. And I promise you, if you've never had an encounter with God, um, there are few things that we do in this church that truly do bring about that effect on people. I've never had anyone get their feet washed that we've prayed for that was like, eh. Because we're going to be representing Christ. And when you represent Christ and you do the things that Jesus did, everything that Jesus did always drew what? The presence of the Father. So, if our ministers, um, actually Aaron, I need your help today. The Lord actually gave me your name to help us wash feet along with Pastor Shelby. And we're going to ask you to wash some people's feet. Now, now uh, we will also have females doing this. Um, so, you know, if you're like weird, I, guess, I don't know, maybe you just only want women to touch your feet or whatever. We try to be accommodating. Um, thank you, Miss Nicole. You, you knew exactly. What's nice about Miss Nicole is she doesn't have to bend down to do it. Uh, so that's why we usually have her. She, she just leans up over the lip and grabs onto your feet like this because she's a little sharp. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And also, Skylar, would you help us today, please? Thank you. I've, I've, I've tried to, you know, crack some jokes and keep things light. And people say, how can you laugh about certain things? Because I read the end of the book. We win in the end. This is our planet. This is our joint. This is our house. We own everything. Do you know that the Bible says... Those who seek the Lord understand all things. So if people say you're a know-it-all, you say, thank you, I know Jesus. That means I know it all. He's all I need. I hate people who think they know it all. It ruins it for us who really do. How many people know what I'm talking about? Hallelujah. You, you know the people. But I really want you to open yourself up to allow God to minister to you. Now, how many people are very, very uncomfortable with having their feet washed? Okay, come on up. You people don't know us very well. That was, they're like, this church is terrible. Why would you do that? They're not going to come back. You won't get all their tithe money. Your church will shrink and disappear. I want you to hear me. If you never come back again and I only get one shot to allow God to touch your heart, I did my job. I didn't get into this ministry to draw people to myself or to make money. You learn that right off the bat when you go into the ministry. Mm. I want to hear something from God that says, thank you for touching my child and allowing me to touch them through you. That's our payoff. So I'll ask again, and, and I'll phrase it a little differently. How many people here is God telling you, even though you're arguing with them right now, I am not going up there that know that you're supposed to come up here. Now, this is where things get fun. Since no one raised their hands, you're saying, hey, you can't move in the prophetic supernaturally and know who's supposed to come up here. I can come and get you. I lift weights purposely so that I can come and get you. It's, we have a stick in the back? No, I'm just kidding. I want you to do it because you know you're supposed to. I want you to do it because you know that you, you need to experience Christ touching you. And you've walked some places that you've maybe been ashamed of or maybe you've been some things, you've done some things you shouldn't. Yeah, 
We're not into blame. I will tell you that of all of the people that are here, I'm the most evil man outside of Jesus Christ that walked the planet. So pick a sin, I've done them all. And if I didn't, I thought about them. I've been a lesbian for years, so I've even dealt, dealt with homosexuality. It's just, I bounce right into it. It's, we're not here to judge you, we're here to help you. A church should be a hospital for people to come and get healed in a no judgment zone. The Bible says that we are to judge ourselves. And so if the Lord is convicting you right now to come forward to have your feet washed, I'd like you to do that now. I know it's pretty adult, it's pretty bold, but I'd ask you to do that now. Thanks.